before you're seated, turn to somebody and express to them how thankful you are that they are here. Then you may be seated. This is not to burst your bubble. Although I'm thankful that you're here, I'm more thankful that God is here. Right? Now, next week, I'm not going to be here. I hope you're not here either. Right? Because we're not going to be here. We're going to be at TCU 9 a.m. Only one service. Okay? I'll see you there, not here. And we will have our brothers and sisters from the different parishes in the diocese as well, right? And I would like, I would request for you to make them feel what they truly are, part of our family. Okay, so if you express, uh, there's warmth in your greeting earlier, your neighbor, then there'll be more warmth when you make our brothers and sisters come to the next week, okay? Mukhae ninyo ang iting aso. Pwede ba po niya? Make them feel loved. Bless them. Give a word of encouragement to them. And express to them that they're part of our family. The mercy of God is awesome. Actually, let's, let's do a, a, a versical in response. The mercy of the Lord is everlasting. Mercy and mercy are everlasting. No, 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 daily office, what do you do? The mercy of the Lord is everlasting. Yes. 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 Okay, those of you who do daily office, start today. The mercy of the Lord is everlasting. This is, this is seen in, uh, in the Old Testament reading. You know the story, right? Sodom and Gomorrah, their sins, exceedingly great, and it reached the attention of God, and planned, he was planning to come down and pronounce judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah, right? And here is Abraham interceding on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he haggled with God, right? He negotiated with God. And he said, he asked God, why did you find 50 righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah? Are you still going to destroy the city? I mean, far be it from you, Lord, that you would treat the righteous and the wicked alike. Why would you destroy the righteous together with the wicked? So God said, well, for the sake of 50 righteous, I will not destroy the city. And then he haggled again and said, what about 45? What about 40? 30? 20? Then, finally, he said, what if there's ten righteous people? Will you still destroy the city? And God said, no, I will not. My question to you is, what do you think would have happened if Abraham did not stop at ten? What do you think the, the magic number is which in God's mind is non-negotiable. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Negative one. What is the magic number? My Bible says the mercy of the Lord is everlasting. Do you think if he said yes to all those numbers, do you think he will stop at some number? Hindi naman sa sinisisi natin si Abraham. Si Abraham pala may kasalanan nito eh. Tumikil kasi. No. But, the point is, God's mercy is everlasting. It's everlasting. He, I believe he would have spared the city if Abraham continued to just intercede. God is a God of justice and God is a God of mercy, right? 
But sometimes God's ways, not sometimes, always, God's ways are higher than our ways. And sometimes we cannot fathom, we cannot understand His ways. The Bible says His mercy is everlasting. Infinite. Infinite. I'll give you an example of what infinite is. Space is infinite. Right? Tagalog, itong nakikita natin sa labas, di Pasca ng building, kalawakan. Right? Hindi kalawakan, kalawakan. Kalawakan. Walang dulo pataas. Walang dulo pagbaba. Walang dulo pagano, pagganito, pagganito. No end. Infinite. Have you ever thought of that? How can our minds understand that? I mean, we are born into a world where there's a beginning and an end to everything, right? How can there be a supreme being who didn't have a beginning? I mean, it would blow your mind. It's just beyond our mind, right? Not only that, no end. Lord, hindi na mamatay. Saan ang galing? He had to have come from something, right? Or someplace. No, he, he was before Think about that. Don't go crazy about it, but you know, right? Infinite. Our minds cannot reach that level of awesomeness. Now apply that to His mercy. Now apply that to His justice. Sometimes, sometimes we have our preconceived ideas of what justice is supposed to be and that mercy is supposed to be but God is everlasting His mercy is never come to an end and you know sometimes there, because we cannot understand that sometimes we think that mercy is the opposite of justice right? I mean how can God be at the same time the God of justice and the God of mercy? think about this he became more and more merciful as Abraham negotiated with him. Right? Where is justice there? Where is justice there? Where is justice in this? Jesus said, He who denies me before men, him I will deny before my Father and the angels. I know of a prominent character in the New Testament who became the leader of the church and he denied Jesus three times. If we held Jesus by his word, we would have asked him, why didn't you deny Peter before your father? Binigyan mo pa ng manok at nilagay mo pa sa sa tarangkahan ng langit. Right? He didn't deny Peter. In fact, when he resurrected, what did he tell the women? Go to my, tell my disciples and Peter. He didn't deny him before his father. What about St. Paul? When he was Saul, persecuted and killed several Christians, children of God. Justice, our understanding of justice, would tell us, Aba, ay dapat parusahan niya. Right? And we would probably quote the Old Testament and say, an eye for an eye, a tooth for tooth, a life for a life. But God forgave him. Mercy. Where is justice? It's right there. Right there. What about Adam? Adam was responsible for the death of every single human being. Diba? Eh, kung hindi ko magat sa, sa prutas yun eh, sana hindi eh, walang kamatayan, right? It's all his fault. I mean, talk about number of counts or offenses of murder. Billions. Six billion and counting, so to speak. What does God do to him? He forgives him. Is that justice? Yes. Is that mercy? 
Yes, it is. God's ways are higher than our ways. In fact, actually, I could argue with Abraham. Because he said, what if there's 50 righteous? Well, my Bible says there's none righteous. All of us deserve death. That's justice. That we be meted out with death. But it's also justice. Restorative justice. Justice to God's creation. Justice to God's very good creation. That He would restore all things to the original state. And so, and so, somebody who's sinless dies for those who committed the sin. Is that justice? Yes. God's justice. Is that mercy? Yes. God's infinite mercy. God is a God of justice. God is a God of mercy. Where is justice? Right there. Sometimes we think, oh, there's injustice here, there's injustice there. I'll tell you the story, especially for you. I didn't tell the first two services, but especially for you. There's the story about, uh, true story, of an account of uh, something happening on uh, one of Hitler's uh, torture camps. Uh, uh, Concentration. Concentration camp. And back in the 40s, there was this, uh, you know how they exterminated the Israelites, right? One day, there, were, there was an execution. Two adults and one 13-year-old boy. Uh, and it, wasn't, it was too much for the executioner that he refused to do his job on that day. Somebody else had to do it because he just couldn't take it that he would execute a 13-year-old boy. Small. And so they did. But when they were about to, well, well, when they, when they uh, executed, when they, by hanging, they executed by hanging, the two adults died instantly. But the boy, because he was light and small, he hung there between life and death for 30 minutes or so. And so he was pale and, and struggling, and his tongue was out, his eyes were bulging, but he wouldn't die. Can you imagine the, the torture? Can you imagine the, the, the anguish and the pain? He was choking, choking for so many minutes. And the, the person behind the, the author of this story said, and the author heard it, where is God? Where is the merciful God? And then they were made to pass near those who were hanged. And when they did, the author again heard the same voice. Where is the merciful God? And the author said, I heard the voice within me. It said, where is God? Right there. Hanging. Suffering with us with the Lord. He's not outside of our experience. He's going through our experience with us. That's why He was, was made incarnate. So that He would taste death and taste our experience and go through what we go through. So He could empathize with us. That's God's mercy. That's God's mercy. That's God's justice. We obviously don't understand it. It's infinite. Obviously, it's infinite. How can it be, we say, how can it be that you, my king, my sinless king, would die for me? Is that justice? How can it be? We can't reach the mercy and the justice of God. It is justice because it, it was the plan of the God of justice. infinity, no beginning, no end. It's justice. Somebody very beautifully put this. Put it. You can write this down. You can enter it on your gadgets or whatever. But keep this in mind. Very beautifully said. 
God's justice is merciful. And His mercy is just. In other words, He's justly merciful and mercifully just. Man, beautiful, beautiful. His mercy triumphs over judgment. Again, He's still judge. And He judges what happens. Okay? He's still Lord of all. And I'm not preaching a license to sin because God's merciful anyway, right? I mean, He would treat the righteous and the wicked alike, so why not just live like the devil and, you know, just just live your, uh, your uh, hedonism and eat, drink, and be merry because God will be merciful to me anyway. No. The thing is this. When we have just a little understanding of this infinite mercy, we ourselves, out of gratefulness, out of thankfulness, will say, I don't ever want to offend God anymore. He doesn't like sin. Why would I sin? After He has forgiven me and shown mercy on me, why would I offend Him? I wouldn't want to. So what we do instead is take advantage, if I may say that, take advantage of this love, this compassion, this mercy that God has for us, avail of it, know Him, and make this good news of His mercy known to others. Right? We do that by, by seeking for it, knocking and asking for it. The Gospel today, Jesus said, Ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened. It's a promise, right? You ask, it will be given to you. You seek, you will find. You knock, it will be opened to you. But, he, but what he actually means is, keep asking. Keep seeking. Keep knocking. He wants us to persistently pray. Not, not because uh, the persistence or the repetition will get us the answer. You know, in Matthew 6, he actually even says, Jesus actually says, that the Gentiles think that their many words would merit an answer from God. And he said their meaningless repetition will get them nowhere. Because many words don't affect God. And in fact, he says, actually, before you even pray, God knows what you need already. Now, in the parable of the gospel today, it would seem like God answers our prayers because he's annoyed, right? The neighbor, the neighbor, you know, got up because... I am restored to the kapit by and tinapay, right? God is not like that. It doesn't mean that God is, you know, answers our prayer because he's thinking, I'm putting the money to the para matigil na sa ko din ko prayer. No, of course not. The emphasis is on the persistence in prayer. Again, God already knows what we need before we even ask. So why does he want us to pray? and pray consistently and persistently. Because prayer is not simply asking. Prayer is aligning ourselves, our wills, and our desires with those of God. Prayer is not influencing God by pestering Him. But it's aligning our heart with God so we become more and more after His own heart. He wants to accomplish what concerns us, Psalm says, but still He wants us to pray. Because our persistence in our prayer is not for our will to be done, but for His to be done. This portion of the Gospel in Luke 11 is actually preceded by the first verses of chapter 11, which, which are about the Lord's Prayer. And what does the Lord's Prayer say? Thy will be done. We pray so that God's will is done, not our will. Our will can go anywhere from, if you're a child, uh, 
ang gusto mo yun. Kung ano man, uh, toy car, uh, Pokemon, Dota, you know, computer games. If you're a teenager, uh, tall, dark, and handsome boyfriend. Or uh, uh, model body, long legs, uh, bellow skin girlfriend, right? Tapos, pag medyo matanda-tanda na, I want a house, a bigger house, bigger appliances, sports car, etc. Right? Pag medyo matanda na, Lord, kunti buhok lang. You know? Those are our will. Wills. God's will. We pray because we want God's will to be done. We keep asking not until we get our will, but so we increase in the knowledge of the will of God and His love, and so grow in understanding His will. We reach out to God's heart because we find the joy of doing so until our will becomes enthroned in His. Until our world becomes enthralled in His love. We keep praying, seeking and asking, and knocking so that we become, until we become firmly rooted in Him, as St. Paul told, told the Colossians. We take deep root by persistently aligning ourselves, our hearts, our desires, our wills to His. We do that in prayer, communing with Him, and listening to Him through His Word also. Firmly rooted, St. Paul says, and then we, be, we become built up in Him. I believe that individually and as the Church of God. So that also we can be instruments of this good news, this extremely good news of God's compassion, faithfulness, and love and His mercy. Time is in God's hands. You know, uh, after 37 years, we've been granted the opportunity to own our land. That is the fullness of time that is in God's hands. There's two concepts of time. Chronos, which is linear, which is January, February, or Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. A la una, a las dos, a las tres, a las cuatro. Linear. Chronosion, chronology, chronological. But kairos in the Greek means the fullness of time. That which is God has appointed as the right time for things to happen. And it's a convergence of time, of space, of events, of, of matter, uh, converging and intersecting with God's course of action and His invitation to us to participate. Fullness of time. Did God intend for us to take 37 years before He would give us our land? It could have been shorter. It could be longer. Bottom line is, now is the time for us to march upon the land. God so judged it. This is the time. Because time is in His hands. And everything else. Because He's in control of everything. Acts 17 says that God is the Lord of all and appoints times, ordains times and sets them, and also boundaries. You know, if you think you're, or you know, you're, you're going through a struggle, or experiencing injustice, or, you know, having difficulty, let me say this. God sets boundaries and there is an end to that. In, um, in one hospital, in the delivery room, no, no, in the labor room, I remember this because I was with my wife, long ago, it said, even labor, uh, even labor has an end. Even labor has an end hours to some a few minutes to some several hours God sets boundaries he tells the waters of the sea thus far you shall go and no further he tells uh, 
He tells despots. He tells dictators. He tells oppressive leaders. Hanggang dito ka lang. He tells events. Hanggang dito lang kayo. Hindi ko papabayaan. Remember, remember the tribulation days in, 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 in uh, the New Testament that Jesus uh, was talking about? He said, unless those days were shortened, no flesh would survive. Because God knows. He sets boundaries. Which is why we give our lives to Him. We yield our lives to Him. Until the appointed time, until the right time, until the kairos time, until the fullness of time, what do we do in the meantime? We occupy. He said, occupy until I come. I believe this word is for Cathedral of the King. I told the three messes here, there are this. We need to go back to a lifestyle of prayer. Consistent, persistent prayer. Both the person beside you, tell them he's talking to you. We need to go back there. Before, years ago, this same church, this same church observed, I believe this, at least many of us, observed what we would call quiet time. Do we still observe that? This is why we have daily office to aid us in our quiet time. This is why we have a collectionary. This is why we have vigil on Saturday nights, remember? You should remember if you do it. Right? Saturday nights, vigil. Didn't stop. Never stop. Church fathers said, encouraged or instructed, the people to read the gospel and the readings prior to coming to worship on Sunday. They said so that when you get to Sunday, you can say your Amen. But that's what they encourage. Because we are supposed to be one journeying as one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Okay, again, going back to prayer, asking is only one aspect of prayer. The bigger part is our active participation. When we, 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 when we pray, God, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Guess who's on earth? We. We participate in the, the will of God happening on earth. It is wrong to just say, oh, we lift it all God, uh, up to God. It's up to Him. Well, He has His part, grace and mercy. We have our part, asking, seeking, knocking, occupying, until he comes. Because we do that. We cannot just seek for a few seconds, you know. Like I said, we have Jesus really meant keep asking. Keep pray uh, seeking. Keep knocking. You know, in um, at my house, and I, I'm sure this it is true in many other houses, it's like you know how that the Bermuda Triangle eats uh, whatever aircraft flies over it, right? Divide. Bermuda Triangle, mysteriously, uh, aircraft don't make, make it past that portion, right? No, I will lie. It's like that at my house when it comes to hairbrushes and socks. Somebody, I don't know, it's just... They disappear. You know, I have twice or three times I have bought one hairbrush for each member of the family. Twice or three times. What happens? Only mine remains. And so what do others do? They use my hairbrush. My hairbrush stays in one place if I use it, because I replace it. Others, they leave it everywhere. I don't know. Same is true with socks. Uh, 
Anyway, and so sometimes I would ask one of the children, who used my hairbrush? Every time, nobody does. It just, I don't know, it probably ha I probably got hair, a hairbrush that has legs on it. And it makes its way out of the, the box that I put it in. And so I asked one of the children sometimes, I would go, can you look for my hairbrush? And then they would go, drag themselves to, to a baby. And then after like five or ten seconds, they would go, I can't find it. Five or ten seconds. When God tells us to keep seeking, He doesn't mean seek for ten seconds. It doesn't mean pray for five seconds. Keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking, and then, and then the door will be open. And then you will find. And then the answer will be given. Active participation of the heart. But that, that doesn't mean we, we don't depend on God's grace. We still depend on God's grace. But we do so. We occupy until the comes. One day, I believe, restoration of all things will happen. One day, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Jesus. One day, the glory of the Lord shall cover the whole earth as the waters cover the sea. That, to me, is the end of all things. Because God, God promised it. Between now and then, I don't know what will happen. Between now and then, I know. God is in control and time is in His hands. What a privilege for us to be given the opportunity to be part of it. Until then, the fullness of time, we keep asking, seeking, knocking, pressing on with the goal of being like our Lord. The fullness, the embodiment of God's love, commitment, faithfulness, and mercy. Brothers and sisters, that's the way it is in the kingdom of our merciful.